All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this November Door County Maritime Speaker Series presentation. Uh, thank you very much to Door County Medical Center and Bridgeport Resort, who is graciously putting up Mr. Ackenbach this evening. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, we ask that you keep your video off to assist with our bandwidth as well as keep yourselves muted. Anybody turn your phones off, please, if you're here. Um, please hold your questions to the end, then Jerry will be happy to answer them. He, he said also he cha he's challenging anybody to come up with the hardest question that they can. Not just for the <laughs> so um, we're gathered tonight, November 3rd, 2022, uh, to hear a presentation about the Great Lakes Maritime Academy fleet with Jerry Ackenbach. Great. Thank you uh, for arriving. Thank you for joining us on Zoom. It's great to be here. Uh, I was invited to do this in early 2020, then that COVID thing happened. So it's really nice to be able to get back face to face and uh, drive over from Traverse City. My name is Jerry Ackenbach. Uh, for the last 12 years, I had the honor of being the superintendent of uh, Northwest Michigan College's Great Lakes Maritime Academy. I graduated from a different Maritime Academy. I went to New York Maritime Academy, uh, City Maritime College, graduated in 86, sailed on my license for three years, got a little bit of Great Lakes time, not, not, not a tremendous amount. 1989, figured, well, let me just go into Coast Guard for three years and see, you know, get veterans preference and go back to Merch Marine. And 22 years later, I'm still there, retired as a commander in order to accept this job. So a couple of things, you know, um, you know, Great Lakes Maritime Academy is one of only six state maritime academies in the United States. Uh, what is our mission? Our goal is to graduate officers for the U.S. Merchant Marine with an emphasis on ensuring supply of officers for the U.S. flag vessels and Great Lakes service. So, you know, just a couple of general points. You know, what is the Merchant Marine? So in a, in a very brief sense, uh, a merchant vessel is not a recreational vessel. It's not a pleasure vessel. It's not a military vessel. Really almost everything in between that. And we tend to think about large freighters, tankers, passenger vessels, but you also have municipal ferries, the Staten Island Ferry, Alaska Marine Highway. They're considered merchant vessels. Research vessels, Woods Hole, Scripps University, those are, those are merchant vessels. Uh, probably the largest merchant fleet in the US today is military sea lift command. And those are Navy owned, but civilian manned vessels, fleet oilers, ammunition vessels, they have some research vessels. So that's what's meant by the Merchant Marine. Uh, if a vessel is over 100 tons, you have to have a Merchant Mariner's credential. Anybody who holds a Merchant Mariner's credential is a Merchant Mariner. <coughs> well, <coughs> excuse me, we'll talk about the cadets program, they have to take a license exam. Well, there's a series of license exams. If you are a hundred ton or a six pack charter or a tugboat license, 500 tons, our cadets have to take what's known as the unlimited third mate license or third assistant engineer if they go on the engineering track. And briefly, you know, the, uh, the track on a large American vessel is third mate, second mate, first mate, captain, or third assistant engineer, second assistant, first assistant, chief engineer. And those are known as what is unlimited licenses for on a deck side, unlimited tonnage. They can work on a small vessel or all the way through 100,000 plus ton tanker. And on the engineering side, it's unlimited horsepower. You know, they can be serve as an officer on a vessel with a, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 20,000 horsepower. And what is the Jones Act? Briefly, Jones Act is really a series of laws by this point in time. But what it does is it requires any car, any commercial cargo going between two U.S. ports to be U.S. owned, U.S. built, and U.S. crewed. And without the Jones Act, we would not have a U.S. merchant group. So what, what is our program of study? All the cadets are on a bachelor's degree. They must get the bachelor's degree. Um, the laws we fall under also require that they must pass either the unlimited deck or the unlimited license as a condition of graduation. So the cadet can come to us and say, hey, I got into law school or I wanna go in the Air Force. I really don't need the license. We cannot legally give them the diploma without the license. Or they can say, I just wanna work on a ship. I don't need these humanities classes. Nope, they're, they're intertwined. And that goes back to my generation, the eighties, for anybody who knows, merchant shipping was very tough in the eighties. So there weren't many jobs. My roommate never sat for his license. We were in New York City, he got a job on Wall Street, he didn't bother. And there's quite a bit of federal funds in, in the maritime academies. Um, and they're there to make sure there is a cadre of licensed officers for time of national need. So the law has been passed that all the schools, the federally re regulated maritime academies must make passing the license a condition of graduation. 
our cadets and all the cadets at the State Maritime Academies do have the option to earn a commission in the U.S. Navy Reserve. Uh, it used to be called the Merchant Marine Reserve. Now it's called the Strategic Sea Lift Officer Program. It's different from the reserves that most people think about one week in the year, two weeks a year. I'm uh, sorry, one week in the month, two weeks a year. It's designed for merchant mariners. Um, so the Navy has got a cadre of professional mariners in time of need. So these cadets, upon graduation, they'll be commissioned as ensigns in the U.S. Navy. But rather than the traditional drill, they have to keep their license. They have to sell their license. They have to report in, try and do two weeks a year. But it's really something to make sure that they're available in time of need. If they apply and they're accepted, they'll get $32,000 while they're at the academy. That's a, about 40% of the cost of attending Great Lakes Maritime Academy. Talk about all the cadets that are required by federal law to pass their license, we require them as a condition of graduation to also get their Great Lakes pilotage. Uh, so if you're going to sail on the Great Lakes, in addition to needing an unlimited license, you also need pilotage. You know, something to think about, you know, motorcycle endorsement or a ha really more of a hazmat endorsement on a CDL. Um, so the, the license exam, both deck and engine seven modules. But there are eight waterways that make up Great Lakes pilotage, the Five Lakes, the St. Mary's, the St. Clair, and the Detroit River. Each of, each of those waterways is another three modules. So our deck cadets, in addition to having to complete a bachelor's degree, must complete the seven module third mate's license, unlimited, and then another uh, 24 pilotage modules. So 31 Coast Guard exams they must pass uh, to, to graduate. The engineers, they just have to take the seven module um, engineering license, but they are required to get the both the steam and the diesel endorsement. Even though there's less steamships every year and there are no new ones, there's still a few out there. And the Navy has, or the military is what's known as a reserve fleet. Uh, vessels that are in places such as Beaumont, Susan Bay near San Francisco that are an anchor and ready for time of need. And there's still a lot of steam there. So our engine cadets must also get the steam endorsement. So merchant marine training in the United States, there are seven, I'll call them federally regulated maritime academies, one federal, uh, the US Merchant Marine Academy and six state maritime academies. Um, we are all regulated by the US Maritime Administration as MARAD as we call them. The curriculum is approved by the US Coast Guard. Um, so every five years, we have to submit a substantial package. I think the last one was 1,006 pages and for the Coast Guard to approve our curriculum. And then the two years after that approval, we're audited by the Coast Guard. Now there are numerous other facilities, both public and private that are, that are exceptional, but that's not what, what I'm talking about tonight. You know, so things like the Seattle Maritime Academy, world-class organization, but they're not a state maritime academy. Uh, Delgado Community College is in New Orleans is exceptional, Tidewater. So this is not at all to, um, uh, demean any of those, but just my focus is on the, the seven federally regulated academies where the license is embedded in the uh, bachelor's degree curriculum. We also fall under a different set of laws. So if somebody wants to uh, work, the, you know, not go to an academy, get a job on a vessel, work their way up from ordinary seamen, able seamen to mate, um, they would fall under a different set of CFRs. We fall under what's known as 46 CFR 310. And I'll probably allude to the STCW code. STCW is the acronym Standards Training Certification and Watchkeeping for Seafarers. It is the international treaty that governs merchant marine licensing, and it's been incorporated by reference into the CFRs. It's competency-based training. You know, so rather than the U.S. the legacy U.S. system where you would study and you'd pass an exam, it's a series of competencies. Okay, demonstrate you can light off a boiler. Demonstrate you can raise the anchor. Demonstrate you can you know, tie certain knots. Um, and that's really what our Coast Guard certification is. There's about 400 of these competencies in a deck and about 300 of the engine, and we have to show the Coast Guard where they are in, within the syllabi and all of the um, for all the classes they take. And I'm from New York, you haven't figured it out, so I talk fast, so I'm apologizing. Uh, so the first one I'll talk about is the Federal Academy, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, and that's a picture of it. It's an incredible um, facility located in Kings Point, New York. For those who don't know it, um, think about the Great Gatsby. It's one of the areas that is uh, potentially was known as, I think it was East Egg and Little Egg, or uh, Little Egg and Big Egg. And, and in the middle, you see a white building. That was Walter Chrysler's estate. Allegedly, don't quote me on this one, it was placed so we could see the spires of the Chrysler building. 
Not sure if that's true. You can't do it now at the bridges, but it kind of makes sense. Um, when they passed the Merchant Marine Act, I think it was a 36, and the nation decided to establish a federal academy, well, where was it going to go? In World War II, I believe, most of the Merchant Marine training was done in Sheep's Head Bay, Brooklyn, but the decision was made, and I think probably the Chrysler family donated that estate, so that's where the federal academy is located at this time. Established by the Merchant Marine Act of 36, it's one of five federal service academies. It's right, it's established and it's right up there with Annapolis um, Air Force, West Point, Coast Guard. Um, all the midshipmen are in a regiment. They have to meet the age and physical requirements similar to the other services. They must get a congressional nomination. Um, they do have an obligation, but different from Annapolis and, Air, and Army where they've got a service obligation of X amount of years in active duty, they have to sell, graduates from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy must sell their license for a certain amount of months, for a certain amount of years. They also must um, serve as a Naval Reserve officer in that strategic sea lift officer program I alluded to earlier. Now, go through the state maritime academies in age. The oldest one is the one I attended. Uh, State University of New York, SUNY Maritime College. Anybody familiar with New York? That's the Throgs Neck Bridge. Literally, it's underneath the Throgs Neck Bridge. I walk under the bridge every day, going between the dorms and classes. Um, it's located in the Bronx, New York. It's founded in 1874, first of all, the training on board a training ship named St. Mary's. It became land based in 34, literally one of the last acts by then New York Governor FDR before he. To, uh, assume the presidency. So one of the last things that Governor Roosevelt did was donate that land uh, to New York or transfer it from, from New York to the what was what was the New York SUNY system um, for merchant marine training. And that came up a few years ago, probably more like 20 years ago. There was discussion about for a variety of reasons of New York using that facility for something other than merchant marine training. And the discussion was, well, if they, if they eliminate the maritime training, they may have an issue with um, who, who holds the land or ability to sell it. Um, so when I attended SUNY Maritime in the, the mid eighties, everybody was in the regiment and there was either deck or engine. That was pretty much it. But they, the world has changed and they, they have uh, expanded uh, not only the size of the college, but also their offerings. Uh, they've got many more majors and they've got uh, the regimented cadets in the pro program equivalent to what I went through or my brother went through as an engineer, um, but they also have non-regimented programs, uh, international transportation trade, facilities engineering, electrical engineering without the license component, and those students have the option of being a regiment or not being a regiment. But, and interestingly, they also have regimented students who are not pursuing a license. That tends to be ROTC. So somebody's an ROTC and they have the option to do Navy Marine Corps training. Okay, I'd rather do that than sell the training ship. So they move away from the license program. The next oldest one is Massachusetts Maritime. Very similar to New York in a lot of ways. It began as an institution um, on board a training ship, 1891, and they moved to a shore-based facility in 1936, uh, located in Buzzards Bay, Cape Cod, Maryland, Massachusetts. Um, similar curriculum to SUNY, but they're the only ones that require everyone to be in a regiment. So think about more like a VMI or a Citadel. I personally like that model. You know, everybody's either in a regiment or like GLMA, where we're not regimented, as opposed to the mixture of uh, traditional college students and regimented college students in the same dorms, in the same class, so they separated from dorms. But Mass is different. Excellent, excellent engineering program, excellent school, but where they're different from everyone else is whether you're pursuing a license or not, you will be in a regiment. The next one, let's see. The next, next oldest one is California Maritime Academy, CMA. They were established by a California legislator in 1929. Funding was difficult, but it became more stabilized after passage of the Merchant Marine Act of 36 located in Vallejo, California, uh, the Bay Area, part of the California state or the CSU system. They're the only federally regulated maritime academy on the West Coast. Uh, their student model is very similar to SUNY, a wide variety of majors, licensed, non-licensed, regimented, non-regimented. Then next one is Maine Maritime Academy. I think the first thing I'll say about them is we work with a, a law firm in DC to represent us on Capitol Hill. And uh, the lawyer is from the UP. And he visited Maine Maritime Academy, told me I'm from the UP, I know small towns. Castine, Maine is a small town. So it's very, very isolated. Um, but it is one of only three state maritime academies with Naval ROTC, the others being New York and Texas. 
if somebody from, well, we're in Traverse City, some of the community says, my son, daughter didn't get to Annapolis, should they come to Great Lakes Maritime? Tell them I'd be happy to have them, but they should take a hard look at Maine Maritime. If you like Northern Michigan, you like Northern Maine, and if you're thinking about being a Naval officer, then there's a real advantage to being in an ROTC program. They were established by the Maine legislature in 1941. They are literally the only entity in that zip code. You know, that's how isolated Castine Maine is. Um, they also have the mixture of regimented, non-regimented, licensed, non-licensed program. They also have an excellent two-year program, associate's degree, I believe, with a, with a, a license geared for working on tow vessels. They, they were the first ones. SUNY also has a graduate program, but I believe Maine was the first one to have a graduate program. Really, they're all good, but you Maine, Maine is, Maine's uh, doing some great stuff there. Next oldest one is Texas A&M Maritime Academy at Galveston. They are a division of Texas A&M College Station, established in 62 by General Rudder. General Rudder was an A&M graduate, a uh, um, hero of D-Day, and uh, when he became the chancellor of A&M, he is the one who established the Maritime Academy. Their training ship is the temp training ship uh, General Rudder, located in Galveston. Um, they are considered Aggies, the same as the A&M. Anybody who knows time, has spent time in Texas, the Aggie ring is an important thing to them. So if you go to Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, or Kingsville, you don't get the Aggie ring. But even though they're not on College Station, they're Aggies, they get the Aggie ring, and they're, they're very proud of that. But they're also another very good school, and, and they're the ones in the Gulf Coast. You know, they've got the built-in advantage of, it's an awful, it's a different industry, but it's a very large and growing industry, the offshore supply, the oil exploration industry, and they are about 40 minutes from Houston. So opportunities for shore side employment, uh, ships brokers, uh, the energy sector. So got, they've got some real advantages there also. And here we are, Great Lakes Maritime Academy, Traverse City, Michigan. And what's our emphasis? So we are a division of Northwestern Michigan College. Uh, we're unique. We are a four-year bachelor's degree program embedded in a community college. Um, the exception of machine shop and welding, all the maritime courses are held on that campus, uh, known as uh, Northwest Michigan College's Great Lakes Campus. Um, general education, financial aid, student veteran support, Housing, dining facilities are all on the college's main campus. I think it's almost exactly a mile away. The engineers in their second year fall, uh, I think I take machine shop first and then welding, that might be flipped, but they take uh, those classes on a different campus, about a mile and a half away, but it's all in Traverse City. It's all very close. Um, training ship state of Michigan, which we'll get to in a bit, um, that is used for uh, training. Hopefully some of you've seen it in your travels throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, but when the ship is not underway, it's on campus being used as a lab. And again, housing and dining are all on main campus. And it's kind of nice, you know, when they come to the academy, they're in uniform, but they can be, they can decompress, they can be college students when they're, uh, when they're not there. So they're, they're not living on, on the Maritime Academy, they're on a regular college campus, and they got a chance to be regular college students. So job opportunities, uh, and this is as of this morning, a conference call I was on, the U.S. Navy, Department of Defense, Transcom, Maritime Administration are very concerned with the lack of U.S. Merchant Marine officers. My personal opinion is I think what happened when COVID hit a uh, generation of mariners, late 50s, early 60s, they could retire, but they couldn't afford to take a couple of years off. They didn't like what was happening with COVID. So people who didn't expect to retire, retired in 2010. So I, I personally think we had about three years of retirement in one year. So there's definitely a void right now um, in merchant marine officers in the United States to the point where it's getting uh, heavily scrutinized at the highest levels of Congress and the Department of Defense. Um, I can safely state that the only 2022 graduates who are not employed are not seeking employment. You know, they're just taking a gap year. They decide to do something else um, because just just the phone calls we've gotten. Hey, we, we need a mate. We need an engineer. You know, I'm aware of more companies looking for more people since graduation than we graduated. So it's a great time. I would say, having been around maritime education since the late 80s. I have never seen demand for merchant marine officers higher than it is today. It even exceeds events such as Desert Storm. Demand for engineers is always strong, shoreside and afloat. Uh, what I would tell when if I'm seeing a cadet and their parents, um, uh, and they're undecided whether they want to be decker engine, I'll tell them I went to New York Maritime. I was a deck graduate. I live in Michigan. I drive a pickup. I love Michigan. I love my job. I like my pickup. 
My brother was an engineer. He lives in San Diego and he has two BMWs. So, you know, the, 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 the engineers will do very well. And part of that, though, is if you can operate a power plant on a ship, you can operate one ashore. So there's an awful lot more shore side jobs for engineers than there are for, for deck officers. Uh, and not even the municipal power plants, but Michigan State, University of Wisconsin, hospitals, uh, hotel chains, they all have their own power generation systems. They need engineers. So the ability, you know, the cadets are always, oh, I'm going to go to sea, I'm never going to get married, and my parents never get sick. They're so cute at that age. Uh, but life happens, and, you know, eventually more than a few, okay, I need to, I can't go to sea for six months a year. On the deck side, there's not as many opportunities. On the engine, it will do as well ashore as it will afloat. Recruiting visits, just as I put in my slides together last week, looking at some notes, just off the top of my head, uh, this semester alone, we've had recruiting from Great Lakes Fleet, McAllister Towing, MMP, MEBA, two large unions, GNH, Galveston and Houston Towing, Camp Traverse City to recruit. AMO, another union, Military Seal of Command, Andre Towing, Interlake, DTE, uh, power, municipal power plant come, uh, operator in Detroit, and Crowley, uh, probably the, the largest tank ship operator in the United States, have all traveled to Traverse City to recruit our cadets. So here's where we started to look. You know, this was the original um, academy in 1969. And I'll say uh, we celebrated our 50th anniversary in academic year 2019-2020. And part of that is we want to record the history, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but rather than write a linear history, we started to think about, okay, you know, when they decide to have a six-state maritime academy, put it on the Great Lakes, we can make that sense. Why Michigan over Ohio and Wisconsin? Well, that's congressional politics, but then why Traverse City? You know, so you've got six-state maritime academies, Boston, New York, Houston, San Francisco, Traverse City. You know, how, how did that happen? So what we tried to do when we wrote the book is record the events and the people that made it happen. Unfortunately, most of them are not with us, but we were able to get oral histories from the few that were and people who worked with them. So that's, that's the purpose of the book. And please grab a copy. I brought 44 of them with me and take as many as you like. But part of that is, so it was, the academy was started in a uh, old cherry processing plant in, in uh, Grand Traverse Bay. There's a photo of it from the 1940s. And how do we get from that to this? And it really goes to the gentleman on your right or your left, uh, Mr. Les Biederman. Uh, I, paraphr I took a lot of his autobiography and we incorporated it into the book, but uh, he grew up uh, a rough life uh, um, in the turn of the last century, uh, got very involved in radio and looked at a map and said, okay, the, the last part of America that didn't have radio service was Traverse City. So he established a radio station and to say he did well afterwards uh, is an understatement, but he also gave back to the community. Uh, he was a believer in education. He's the reason why Northwest Michigan College was founded in 52. And he always had a vision of a maritime component of Northwest Michigan College. His original vision in the 50s was to get either an old passenger vessel or a, a troop transport and have the ship sail during the academic semester. Basically, rather than be in uh, a classroom setting for 17 weeks, you would take classes on a ship, but the ship would dock and you'd go to museums, you'd go to cultural sites for a lot of reasons, mainly expense, that didn't happen, but he never gave up on the idea of a maritime component for Northwest Michigan College. Captain Mike Hemmick is a World War II veteran, the Merchant Marine graduate of Kings Point. Um, he was the first superintendent and I put his picture up there, just mainly because the Faculty I talked to who were cadets when he was there, somebody said, if you wanted a picture of a captain, that's what you draw. And so in addition to building the academy, a lot of sweat equity, and he's the reason why it was a success, but also you know, he, just, he just looks like a captain. So the academy was started and the first vessel was the Allegheny. And this is how things were different in the 60s. So in order to become a state maritime academy, the governor has to request from the maritime administration to be designated as a state maritime academy. The bill in the Michigan Senate to request that the governor make that request still had not passed. So it was still a proposal. Mr. Biederman got the Navy to donate a uh, excess salvage tug for a college that did, for a program that didn't even exist yet. Now, that wouldn't happen today. But so they, they got it. They, they, the Navy said, okay, they transferred the Allegheny to Northwest Michigan College. 
but they just got a tow vessel that hadn't been used for years. How did they take money? How did they get it to work? So they hit upon the idea of the Allegheny Club. And these were, you know, uh, civic leaders from Traverse City. They've become a member of the club. They paid $100 and uh, had the honor of meeting who I think is the last surviving charter member uh, about two years ago when we wrote the book. Um, and they, on their time off, they were the vessel, the Allegheny was in Philadelphia. And they would go there on their time off. So had private planes that fly down and then spend weekends, spend vacation. Uh, and these were accountants, lawyers, bankers, chipping and painting. Uh, they got their Coast Guard credentials to serve as deckhands. And uh, they just put a lot of swag, sweat equity into making sure the Allegheny would be ready. And they were the crew that brought it through the seaway in 1969. And this is from the Record Eagle. In 1969, in, in $1969, they raised $10,000, which I'm sure would be well over 70,000 these days, uh, just uh, for uh, making the Allegheny seaworthy. Andy Olson was a civic leader. He was on the college's board, and there he is serving as cook on the Allegheny as it made its transit uh, through the seaway uh, 50 plus years ago. Another civic leader, Al Turdell, uh, this is from the Record Eagle, uh, being welcomed by his family after he uh, served as a crew member on the Allegheny. It's kind of a side note, that's Mr. Biederman behind uh, about 5,000 pounds of, of baked goods. When I was doing the research, we're going through the archives, I found a thank you note to him from the commanding officer of the Naval Hospital in Philadelphia. And I didn't, you know, but I didn't say what it was for, just thanking him for everything he's done for him and the sailors. So I talked to his son and his son told me, so he, he still had a radio show and he just mentioned off the top of his head, he had visited the hospital when he was looking at the Allegheny and boy, it'd be great if we could do something for uh, the injured sailors coming back from Vietnam. And he was del deluged with baked goods uh, from the community of Traverse City. So what do you do when you go to pick up a tugboat? He uh, brought the Cherry Queen uh, from the Cherry Fest and 5,000 pounds of baked goods uh, to distribute to the uh, um, uh, sailors who were at the Naval Hospital. And there's also a side note, um, one person from King, um, a, a sailor, you know, a lot of the uh, community members put, put little notes in there for uh, people who are gonna get the, the baked goods. So the sailor wrote a note and they started a correspondence. Well, the sailor was from Kentucky, he was an orphan. He was raised in orphanages, foster homes, joined the Navy at 17. And this family said, well, you know, we've adopted kids, we'll adopt you. So the following Christmas, he flew to Kingsley, Michigan and met his new family. And they gave him a Holstein as a Christmas present. So, <laughs> so just don't know, don't know what happened after that, but just, you know, kind of things were different back then. And uh, but I thought that was a really good side note to the establishment of the uh, academy. So the Allegheny was really never used as a training ship for a variety of reasons, but the second vessel we got was the Hudson, another uh, Navy salvage tug, and that was, you know, really the, the unsung hero. So between, you know, the early 70s up to 2002, that was the Academy's training ship, was used regularly, cadets got some sea time on it, they understood uh, what underway life was about, learned the corporate culture, they got the majority of their sea time on commercial vessels, but it was a great training asset. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, between the Allegheny and the state of Michigan, but it really shouldn't be forgotten. But it wasn't always uh, smooth sailing. So when the Academy was started, Vietnam was, the Vietnam War 1969 was going on, uh, but that was wrapping up in the early 70s. Anybody who follows merchant shipping, there are highs and lows for employment. And a lot of them are based on uh, military events. So in the early 70s, um, this is from the AFL-CIO News. Uh, There's a resolution from the Seafarers Union calling for suspension of the academy. Uh, resolution charged the academy is an unnecessary burden on taxpayers, that there are enough officers already on the Great Lakes, and they did have their own training facility, and that really it was being, uh, at, uh, the steel companies were the ones who were pushing it. So uh, it, the heat, it, the concerns were such that the Coast Guard sent a team down from headquarters to investigate the academy. Allegations were all they did was take the existing college curriculum and call it maritime. Uh, but um, uh, the Coast Guard found, no, uh, they're doing a good job. It is a true maritime academy. But um, th there were some challenges early on. As we wrote the book, we reached out to the union because I didn't want to, I wanted to give them a chance to reply. And here's the replies. Uh, the SIU, the union that uh, wrote the letter I, I alluded to, 
any of the SIU's concerns about Great Lakes Maritime or ancient history. We've worked well together for decades and look forward to continued joint efforts to promote and protect the U.S. Merged Marine. Uh, Mr. Dahl, the president of the American Maritime Officers, the largest union, said, like the Great Lakes shipping industry itself, union has transformed and AMO supports the academy and its mission completely. Uh, we have a board of visitors. All the union representatives are represented there. They recruit uh, many of our uh, graduates that have joined uh, unions. So we wrote the book. Um, I'll say that myself and my boss basically created a 200 page Word document. We were lucky to have Miss Ann Sweeney. Uh, Miss Sweeney retired after the uh, book was published. It was really her, her baby. Uh, she's the one who turned this massive Word document into the book that I've got there. She was the archivist. She spent at least 30, if not 40 years in the college's library. And she said, I want to write a chapter on the first female cadets. So that chapter is the one she wrote. Um, and I think I've got the excerpt from the college's catalog in 1969. It says Maritime Academy proposed, wasn't a done deal yet, but it did have this, what you had to do to apply. One of them had to be a male. And that changed in the late seventies. And uh, we were able to record some of the recollections. I will say um, it wasn't um, the seismic change. It was the other academies. You know, the other, we have New York Maritime that for hundred plus years have been all male, uh, Massachusetts Maritime, uh, West Point, Annapolis. So we, we were only, you know, of the, our 50 plus years in existence was only male for eight or nine, but it was an important chapter and uh, Ms. Sweeney made sure it got documented. And these are some photos of the uh, first young women uh, who joined us in 79. And uh, there's a, a photo of the group from 2017. Uh, Pre-COVID, and hopefully we'll see it again in the very near future, there was an annual conference called Women on the Water, sponsored by the Maritime Administration, it's supported by industry and labor, and it would rotate through the academies. We did the first one, and we did another, we, we hosted it again in 2017. There's a photo from that day with uh, some of the young women who have since graduated and are doing great things. The SS Evan Fitzgerald, so uh, we all know that. Uh, the academy had a cadet sailing on the Fitzgerald when she was lost. We also had an alumnus uh, uh, who was on board the vessel who uh, perished when the Fitzgerald sank. Um, in, in your lower left, in the center photograph, you have Mr. Gordon Lightfoot. Uh, Mr. Lightfoot, so after the Fitzgerald, we got the news that Fitzgerald, we started a marriage memorial service. It continues to this day. It will be, uh, we'll be holding it at noon on next Thursday. Uh, 10 November, it'll be live streamed if anybody wants to uh, join us uh, remotely. Uh, but the first one, I uh, think there is um, Mr. Lightfoot. I've never met him. My predecessor, Admiral Tanner, has met him several times. Uh, he is, I, I'll say with confidence, he is the biggest single donor to scholarship funds at the Great Lakes Maritime Academy. Uh, I've never met him, but he's a, he's a true class act. Uh, some of you may have heard of the El Faro, another U.S. merchant vessel that was lost with all hands probably about four or five years ago. I've heard from a very reliable source, um, the family of the Mariners lost on the El Faro wanted them not to be forgotten. They wanted to be remembered, same as the Fitzgerald and Mr. Lightfoot on his own, no press, flew private, flew commercial, got a rental car and met with that family and just talked about the Fitzgerald and how they remembered. And there was absolutely no press about it. So he's a... Uh, I've never met him, but he's a class act and he is an incredible supporter of the academy. There's a picture of uh, one of our memorial services from the mid 90s and in your upper right hand is one from a few years ago. Uh, it's cadet run, uh, we ring a bell, uh, we, we have a small service and we, at, we always ring a bell and read the name of everybody who was lost in the Fitzgerald and we're still honored on a regular basis to have friends, family of Mariners lost in the Fitzgerald joining us every year on 10 November. So TS State of Michigan, that's the train ship we have now. Uh, properly converted uh, from a US Naval surveillance vessel over here in Bay Ship. And anybody has specific questions on the capability on the size, everything is right there. So uh, I'll refer back to that. I guess we want to hold questions to the end. We'll refer back to that. But it's uh, the diesel electric, uh, 224 feet, um, four diesels, uh, two motors. When we received it, so go on here. Originally, it was launched in 85 as a US NS persistent. It was a Tagos vessel. Um, it was involved in 
uh, Cold War research, I'll just say, uh, tug surveillance, either looking for Soviet uh, subs or looking for subs. And, and if there was an American sub there, if they never knew it, they didn't find it, that was good too. When the Cold War ended, it became obsolete um, and it was transferred from the Navy to Great Lakes Maritime Academy. Uh, but we just got a ship, kind of like the Allegheny. And it was a, it was a great hull, it was a good engine, but uh, all the crypto gear was just torn out. There were wires everywhere. Uh, there weren't enough staterooms. Uh, just like any, like any Navy vessel would be tied up for a couple of years. Uh, you hear about uh, earmarks and earmarks not working, but you know, they do work. Um, thanks to Senator Levin from Michigan, the vessel, he was able to obtain $3 million in 2003. Uh, for conversion and the vessel was sent to base ship for several months and it was properly converted to a training ship. Uh, Texas Maritime has a sister ship now known as the General Rudder but it's not Tago's vessel. If you put them side by side it's just night and day how much nicer the state of Michigan is to the General Rudder and it's not a reflection of Texas Maritime but they never got the money to have it properly converted at one time. They did the conversion under the federal process a couple hundred thousand every year and you cannot convert a vessel with that. So thanks to Senate 11 uh, we've got a vessel that Eventually, we need to have to get some new engines. Uh, they're built in 85 and getting spare parts is getting harder for them, but uh, she's in great shape. She's in fresh water, and I've got no doubt uh, she'll be carrying cadets in the Great Lakes Maritime Academy through the Great Lakes uh, long after I've uh, moved on from my current position. And hopefully, that's not going to be the immediate future. Um, so, originally, we used the vessel for a short period of time, uh, and I arrived in the fall of 2010, the summer of 2010 was the first time they did a true six week training cruise similar to the other um, academies. Um, beginning in 2015, we started to do two cruises a year. Uh, the Coast Guard was requiring more sea time, commercial bursts are getting harder to come by. We are, you know, my laser focus is I want to make sure every cadet can graduate per their model schedule. I never want to have a cadet get to graduation and be short sea time. So we started to go to two cruises in 2015. Beginning in 2020, due to COVID, we've now been operating the ship for 180 days a year, uh, give or take a couple of days. Uh, the cadets move on board the Monday after commencement. That's around May 8th, depends on the calendar of lies. That first phase will go to about the 4th of July. A second group of cadets will join uh, between 4th July and late August take a couple of days off to refuel the vessel. And then the ship uh, will operate till around this, we just wrapped it up last Friday. So, you know, about Halloween. Uh, the vessel is owned and maintained, maintenance costs are covered by the US Maritime Administration. We could never afford to operate or uh, maintain a vessel. Uh, all, the, all the dry docks that I'm aware have been done over here in Bay Ship, and it's required to be dry docked by the Coast Guard every five years, that's several million dollars. That's all covered by the Maritime Administration. Uh, we used over 700,000 gallons of diesel in 2022. I'm sure we'll use the same next year, but it'll probably cost us more. Uh, those, the, all the fuel costs were reimbursed by the federal government. That allows us to keep GLMA affordable for our residents of the nation, preferably, from, not preferably, but you know, our focus is on the Midwest. Um, this, uh, we currently charge cadets $45 a day per diem to sail on the state of Michigan. So it's an expensive program, but we are definitely the most affordable of the state maritime academies. Cadet life, what do the cadets do? This is the cadets, they're on a sea project there. I think that's Lake Superior. If you look at this next one, if you look quickly and you look at uh, your lower left, okay, these are cadets on a hell of a ship, that's our simulator. Uh, we, we make wide use of simulation, uh, deck and engine. Talked about the engineers need the steam endorsement. Well, what if they can't get on board a steamship? We've got an engine simulator and they can get, Coast Guard will count that time as steam time and they can get their steam endorsement. And simulators are, are outstanding. And you, you know, you, it fools your mind. Let's say if you've been on a simulator or one of those rides at Disney, you find yourself grabbing, you think you're moving. It also allows the cadets to push the envelope and not hurt anything. You know, we can let them do things that we never let them do on a commercial ship. Okay, you ran aground, but you know, no harm, no foul. Let's back it up and do it again. So simulation is very, very important. Uh, that simulator is uh, about 10 years old. 
think it costs about a million dollars over next summer, 2023. Our plan is to do a substantial upgrade to the simulator. We'll hold on to most of the hardware, but this, it's running, it, it's run off Dell PCs that are running Windows 7. So we need to upgrade. It's becoming unsupportable. But uh, we also want to do some you know, screens upgrade, and that'll be about another million dollars, but it's, it's worth every penny. The uh, it's, uh, it's fun. The cadets enjoy it, and it's a great way for them to experience uh, what it's like to be on deck or in the engine room in a much safer environment. So some recent initiatives, you see so two, two young women on, on your left, uh, also first they're on a tugboat. Uh, now the William Selvick, which is right outside, we had leased that for the last two years. That's a tow vessel in Mississippi. We leased that uh, three years ago, but we needed a bigger one. Um, so we've been leasing a tow vessel every summer and at the end of the day, uh, there's only about 220 deep draft vessels in the US fleet. There's over 5,000 tow vessels, but that requires another license endorsement. So by leasing a tow vessel, a senior cadet, rather than sail on the training ship or rather than sail on a laker, they'll spend uh, 30 days uh, on our leased tow vessel and they'll get the sea time, they can graduate, but they will also get the made of towing or the afternoon's tour. So upon graduation, they'll have Great Lakes pilotage, of a bachelor's degree, they'll have the third mate, they'll also have the tow vessel endorsement. We haven't quite cracked the code to get in what's known as DDE, that's the engineering equivalent of the made of tow vessel. We're gonna work on that very hard. But again, it's, it's another, where the cadets work is their business. My job is to make sure they've got opportunities. So by having that tow vessel endorsement just opens up an entire different aspect of, of, of um, of uh, in a different aspect of the industry can work on. on. On your left, you see two young women at the Great Lakes Culinary Institute. The Culinary Institute is also a division of Northwestern Michigan College. Uh, 2022 marked the sixth, so it's a two year program, uh, an academic year, an internship, and an academic year. Um, so about six years ago, the chief cook came to me and he just looked like he had been beaten up. You know, he's cooking for 60 people, about 40 of them are males under 24. He once made a meal where the average person ate more than a pound of ground beef. And I don't think the young women and the vegetarians are eating a pound of ground beef. So you just, I can't do this by myself anymore. So we went to culinary and we said, well, if you have any students that would be interested in doing an internship on the state of Michigan and we'll get them their Coast Guard credentials and they can sail as culinary professionals in the Merchant Marine upon graduation. And it's just been a spectacular success. Uh, so last year was the sixth year we did it. Um, demand for these, for these students post-graduation is, is exceptional. Uh, we had another young woman uh, about two years later, uh, uh, did her year in culinary, sat with us over the summer, did her fall semester, almost dropped out because money was so tight. Uh, she reached out to the shipping companies and she, they hired her over Christmas break to sell as a second cook. She made enough money to pay off all of her student debt and half of her last semester. Uh, so they, they will do very well for themselves. And it's, a, it's been a really, it's a unique partnership that I think it can only be done in Great Lakes Maritime because uh, the advantage is being part of a community college. So there's multiple degrees and having a culinary uh, college, literally the, the institutes in the same building we are, it's been a great partnership. So knowing this partnership was there, knowing some demand, knowing industry and labor saying we need these people, uh, we put together a one-year certificate program uh, where somebody will enter and after about 13, 14 months of the seat time requirement, they will graduate and they'll be ready to sail in the steward's apartment of a merchant vessel. And so that, that was approved by the board this past August. So we're going, we're working through the details and our goal is to uh, have that first cohort arrive. I'm working, walking around, sorry. Uh, that first cohort to arrive in the fall of 24. Ms. Carrie Fulcher is a recruiter for the program. Uh, if anyone's looking for um, um, a presentation on that, uh, and I'm sure she'd be happy. If not, I can cover for her, but it's, a, it's a really an outstanding program. Um, we try to host uh, Boy Scouts for uh, an overnight, or as I'll call it, on the state of Michigan, Sea Scouts. We probably get Sea Scouts more from uh, any other organization. And we had the Mid Michigan Sea Scouts on board. And I was talking to one of their adult leaders, and I was saying, "Yeah, this program, it's it's going to happen. Give us about two years. We're just working through the accreditation issues." And she said, "That's great. She has Sea Scouts who would love to come to the academy. They'll never be able to afford it, but they can't afford one year." So it's an outstanding program for somebody who wants to sell. Uh, they will make 80,000. They'll make uh, almost as much uh, as, um, as they will if they have a license. 
So why we lose cadets? I estimate that 80% of the, on a good point, I estimate that 80% of our cadets who enroll graduate with a bachelor's degree and a license in five years or less. Some take a little bit longer, some can do it in three. Um, the number one reason by far we lose cadets is finances, uh, not drugs, not conduct, not DUI. Um, regardless of what Michigan law is, I don't know what Wisconsin is, but Michigan has legalized marijuana for recreational and medical. Uh, if you're an emergent marine, you cannot use marijuana. Uh, we have to, by statute, test 50% 50, 50 of everybody at the academy who holds a license in a random urinalysis program. In the history of the academy, nobody has ever failed a random urinalysis. So they're doing great things, and Simon was simultaneously enrolled in a very challenging academic program. Uh, we may be the most cost effective, I think we're the most cost effective state maritime academy, but it still costs 75,000. It was 90,000 uh, when we had a bachelor's degree awarded by a partner institution. It probably may have passed through this. In the history of the academy, we started, it was an associate's degree only. Um, the license was only valid on the Great Lakes. Uh, that, and they got to about 2000, they realized that cadets were being handicapped by that. Uh, they couldn't get a Naval commission. They were not getting shoreside employments because they didn't have a bachelor's degree. So Michigan did not allow community colleges to award bachelor's degree. So they formed a partnership with Ferris State University. It was a, they were a great partner. It was a great program. They would get our associates, they would get the license. Uh, at that, and at 2000, we adopted the SCCW code. So the license was now valid for ocean service. Um, and they would get a bachelor's in business administration. The problem was, was 150 credits. Um, and financial aid is based on the degree, not the credits and degree. So it was very expensive. So um, my predecessor, um, Admiral Tanner, uh, Tim Nelson, the previous college president, it was their focus to lobby. And the last Friday of 2012, uh, Governor Snyder signed a bill allowing Michigan to award community colleges in four disciplines, award bachelor's degrees in four disciplines. One was maritime. So since 20, and we got accredited in 13. So since 2014, we have our own bachelor's degree. The credit load dropped to 120, and that's easily saving the cadets uh, 10 to $15,000. Uh, but it's also an 11 semester program. You know, so the cadets have classes every fall, every spring, and they also have to pick up the equivalent of 300 sea days. So they're going to see over the summer. So there's never a semester off or a summer off for a part-time job. Yes, they can pick up a part-time job here and there, but not enough to really make a difference. So it is an expensive program without the ability to, to really try and, and work a part-time job to, to pay it down. Uh, in our world, we still lose cadets and the parents lose their jobs. And, you know, what is our end goal? To develop the merchant marine officers who will be industry's preferred employees. And I talked about the, uh, the book we put together and please grab a copy, grab two copies. I don't wanna put them back in my truck, but I brought 44 with me and uh, feel free to take it. If anybody uh, who's joined us on Zoom would want a copy, you know, my email address there, um, be happy to mail you one. All right, so 47 minutes, not too bad. Questions? Yes, sir. Do you place any of your graduates on the Western rivers? No, but I think we will soon. So the made of towing and license, there's three types of them, uh, coastal, Great Lakes, and Western rivers. So it's a different license endorsement. But right now, we've got a cadet from Louisiana whose father had a connection and said, hey, I, I'd rather go to the state of Michigan. I'd like to go on this tow vessel program. So we vetted it. So he is currently on a large tow vessel, literally pushing a thousand foot of barges between New Orleans and Chicago. So, and I will be meeting with uh, representatives of that industry in New Orleans in a couple of weeks. And hopefully we can find a methodology for the cadets that's interested to do a sea project. Uh, if they're interested, they can do one on Western Rivers. They'll get the Western Rivers made of towing when they graduate and get the experience. It's a, just a unique aspect of the industry. We've got nobody on faculty who, who, who has connections there, but um, it's, it's big, it's growing. I think you'll start to see, um, currently, I don't think there's any vessels that go much beyond the Sunshine Bridge in Baton Rouge. Uh, there are talk of uh, low profile container ships going through the Mississippi just to take some of the, the heat off of the, the roadways. So, uh, so the answer is not right now, but hopefully so. Our, our business model is we take in 60 to graduate 40. On a good point, we've been taking in 60 to graduate 50. And that is the maximum we can do with the size of the physical plant. 
We take in, we take in 36 deck and 24 engine, and there's a method behind that, the size of the simulator. We talked about the simulator. Well, there's a fire coke in the simulator, so that, that caps the amount of people we have uh, on faculty availability. So if we want to go to get bigger, we would literally need another building. And I, I like that that graduate, take in 60 and graduate, you know, hope, late, I think our graduating class this year is in the mid 50s. Um, but some of those are cadets that should have graduated last year and they stub their toe. But, um, but you know, back in the envelope calculation, I'm confident of saying 80% graduate on, on a regular basis, on an annual basis. Yes, sir. Well, another reason why we want to expand, uh, they're high and low and coming out of COVID, the other, so Kings Point is a uh, federal academy, they, they will always be full uh, congressional nominations. The other uh, enrollment, I will say, um, I think is down at the other academies right now. Um, not sure why. Uh, I will say we met our enrollment goals. I think we had 58 enrolled and 55 showed up. Uh, and what we did is we pulled off the wait list. Our applications are down. Uh, we get about 300 people a year who show interest in the academy via email, about 100 you just never hear from again, they change their mind. Because we're the only academy that doesn't have an application fee, we get about 70 applications for people who have a preference. Their number one choice is Cal Maritime, Kings Point of New York, but they, they need a, a fallback plan. Well, why pay $50 to apply to another academy? I'll apply to GLMA and that'll be my backup plan. Of that, um, 120 true grad, true applications who are focused on Great Lakes Maritime Academy say 110 or deck is not a normal possibility. You know, two places that I'm failing that I'll talk about now as superintendent is very large disproportionate interest in deck over engine, as well as diversity, you know, so um, females run anywhere between eight and I think the highest 12% overwhelmingly Caucasian. So we need to do more reach out uh, and have a more diverse population. But uh, the answer, so enrollment is steady, but applications are down. I can just say from what I've heard from them is they're down, but I don't, I can't, I can't say. No, they're much bigger, much bigger. So we've got about 200 cadets on campus. SUNY has 1700. Kings Point has 1200. I think the others, I think, Main Mass and Cal are probably 800 to 1,000. Uh, Texas, uh, Texas expanded dramatically about 10 years ago when oil was so high. So they're probably about three times the size of us. Uh, so I, that's why I like our size. You know, being part of a community college is great because we can share the cost. I don't have my own financial aid office. I don't worry about the civil engineering. Uh, so th those costs are shared among a much larger uh, campus where the other colleges are, even, even Texas, they're part of A&M, but the other, the other ones are standalone division three schools. They incur all their costs. So if their enrollment is down, um, it's a challenge. But again, they're, uh, I know SUNY and Mass have graduate programs. So there, there, are, there are differences, but as far as the number of, the number of students on campus, SUNY is the largest, Kings Point is I'm saying between 12 and 13. The other ones are probably around 1,000, except for us in Texas, we're about 200, I'd say Texas is three to 400. Yes, sir. Are there out of pocket expenses uh, for documentation? Or yes, so the cadets must get their merchant, entry level merchant mariner credential the first year they're there. They don't need it legally because you don't need a credential to sail as a kid on a training ship. But the reason why we require it is we never want a cadet to find out a year before graduation they can't pass the Coast Guard physical. And it's not, you know, color blindness. Okay, it's another question is why uh, as you take in these applications, do you set something that you keep track of these Well, as, as part of the application process. They must complete the Coast Guard physical, CG719K, I think it's called. And if we see anything, we send to the Coast Guard. And, and, and the questions are always medication. You know, okay, if somebody was on a genetic asthma medication, I, I, I can't just, I, 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 can't, I can't say whether that will lose. So the Coast Guard's very good about quickly saying, yes, they're qualified, no, they're not. In the rare occasion, it's only happened once I've been there, we had a cadet and he was halfway through his first semester. He was so colorblind that he could not even get an engineering license. 
And you know, I told him, you're better off getting this news now rather than before graduation, because his credits are so unique, they're not going to transfer. And this, this, this cadet, could, I'm sure, would go to U of M, Michigan Tech, and um, we, he got 100% refund of tuition. So the application process is designed to make sure there's no issues on the medical side where the Coast Guard will not get the license. Yes, ma'am. Is there an age limit on that, on the applicants? Nope. Uh, I am, I, well, I am 60, so I'm probably older than all the cadets. Two years ago, I was not. We used to have a three-year deck program. Because of COVID, we've had to uh, not, not, uh, not, not register for cadets for that. And that, uh, the reason why we can't is that requires a spring sea project, which requires an ocean sea project. We just haven't gotten versed on commercial vessels and oceans. But, a couple of years ago, uh, we had three young women join us. Um, one was uh, had a had a master's, and she was an art instructor in a community college in New Mexico. Another one had a 4.0 in chemical engineering from either Clemson or Auburn, and she was a law school graduate from Loyola. And then we had another woman who is now working with us as a, a part-time faculty member, who uh, did a career in the Navy as a supply officer. I uh, had a PhD, I think, in Fresenica County, and had a second career teaching the Ohio prison system, and it was a it, it was a it was a bucket list item, and uh, we were happy to have her. And uh, luckily, she's like, well, you know, she's not really looking for full time work, so she sells in a training ship with us, and she's just she's an educator, so she's great on the training ships, great with the cadets, and she's gonna teach a few classes. But generally, when I get somebody a little bit older, I'll say, oh, you'd be happy to have you, but what, what's your goal? Well, you know, I want to work, and they're generally out there thinking about dinner cruises. And I'll be happy to have you, but this is a lot of money. You don't need a license that much, you know. So why don't you think about talk about those community colleges? But no, we have no. If you can pass the Coast Guard physical to get a license, we'll be happy to have you, both of you. So no, there's if you can the the only the only physical requirement is if you can pass if you can pass the Coast Guard physical and you apply, and there's no issues with uh, uh, getting a license, we'll be happy to have anybody. We talked about female diversity, so I, you know, forget about the husband, I think you'd be perfect, ma'am. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. How do you feel about the cruise ships that are mostly foreign flag coming into the Great Lakes now? I, I'm, I'm an educator. Um, I think it's, I, anything that draws attention to the Merchant Marine for me is positive. I like ships. But I, and I know in Traverse City, it's very controversial. I think there's some kind of tourism fatigue. That's all I'll say about that. But I, I, I like ships. I like big ships. Um, some, um, it would be very hard to do it with an American flag ship because I just don't know there's enough business on the Great Lakes to justify a 12 month cruise. And when you start to, and the cost differences between foreign flag and American flag are different. And I will say the, uh, we do allow, four or five, so a GLMA graduate who owns a shipping company in the Great Lakes is the agent and we uh, allow uh, four of those ships to do a port call in Traverse City. And uh, it's a great experience for the cadets. They get the, uh, we have what's known as the, the uh, Coast Guard facility, secure facility. So the cadets get the opportunity to see how to manage a port, a uh, foreign flag port call. And there's jobs for those people if they wanna work in the industry in Miami. Um, and they also give us very large uh, scholarship donations. So for us, um, I, I don't see an issue um, as far as um, them being foreign flag. I wish it was otherwise. I don't think there's a model that you could do it on the American flag. You know, you can do it for smaller tonnage. You know, the American flag cruise ships are all about 100 tons. You're starting to see them in the Mississippi. Uh, I think it's called American Cruise Lines. They have some bigger ones. But you know, there you have a limited season on the Great Lakes. You've got to do something else. It'd be very difficult to do that. I wish it was again. I said I think right now there's probably only about 80 American ships doing commercial cargo transatlantic, transpacific. The cost difference. The cost. Manning is is one cost. Taxes are another. But the build costs are substantially higher. And then when you get into cruise ships, um, you know, Fortin. Ferrari would have a time, hard time building an F-150, Ford would have a hard time building a Ferrari. Finkin Terry, uh, who's right across from us, they, they've been doing it for decades. You know, they've got the trades people to build cruise ships in Italy. You know, if you want to build a cruise ship in America, I think, you know, the, you could easily, not easily, but you could definitely build the ship 
but fitting it out to be a cruise ship, uh, those skill sets really aren't in American yards right now. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a very different, it's almost a niche skill. Yes, yeah, a lot of cruise ships, but compared to the amount of ships being built worldwide, it's very small. So, you know, Italy is not a low labor, low labor country, and there the majority of the cruise ships are being built in Italy because they've got the craftsmen there. So I think, I think it would be difficult to, for an American shipyard to get into that industry. Now, in addition to the concern with merchant mariners, there's a major concern with the Navy, with DOT, with skilled labor in shipyards. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, welders and pipe fitters. Uh, those people are hard to come by. And again, that's a, a very good career for a young person to steady work, but it's uh, having a hard time. So if we're having a hard time getting skilled labor for the, our shipbuilding industry, how are we going to do it for somebody to build a five-star hotel that's embedded in the ship? I would imagine also because the, the industry, say, in Cateria, are they trying to uh, bring people in and Training and, and I'm sure that I'm sure they are. It is a large problem uh, nationwide. I, I don't work in that industry. They do recruit our our cadets. I'll say when we talk about I talked about sea time. Uh, cadets need a year of sea time, but there's allowances for that. An engine cadet can do a sea project in a shipyard because part of the laws that create these maritime academies was also creating labor um, management level labor for the shipyards. So I'm, I'm sure that all the, the shipyards, um, and just today, uh, used to be called, used to be the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. I think it's called Philly Shipyard. They're no longer Navy, but uh, they are, they've got the contracts to build five, the, the exception of GLMA, and we don't want one. There are going to be purpose-built, very large training ships for each of the state maritime academies. New York will get theirs uh, this spring, and the keel has been laid for Mass and Maine's keel will be laid soon. But that shipyard just today was announced. They've got a contract for two or three uh, container vessels, U.S. flag, U.S. built for Matson. And I think they'll be, uh, they may be LNG fueled also. You mentioned the, the foreign flag vessels working in the United States. So what, what is the differences that you see between their training, uh, their training and ours? Um, I, I really more, haven't. I have more regulated than the other. Or? Um, I, I, I'm not going to disparage, you know, different laborers because you have good mariners everywhere. Uh, and, and there are some companies, some allegations, but if you look at the casualty data, uh, there's, you know, of all the ships in the world, all operating, there's very few casualties. You know, you only hear, it's kind of like the airlines, there's years for nothing, but everybody remembers that one year where there was a horrific crash. So, um, I, I think the companies... Is a safety net. The companies, the classification societies, American Bureau of Shipping, Boys Registry, the insurance companies, you know, they, they don't want to get sued and they certainly don't want to get sued in an American port. So I, I think there are professional mariners worldwide of every flag. But I, I honestly, I, I've never been to a training facility in another nation. Yes, sir. I understand you say that it requires a the U.S. Mer the U.S. not us. The U.S. Merchant Marine Academy getting admitted to them is near identical to West Point or Annapolis. The first step is you've got to be nominated by your congressman. So that's a nomination, and then when you're nominated, then you apply, and then you're you're appointed first, and you're nominated and appointed. Uh, but yeah, so to go to the to the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, uh, you need a congressional nomination. And it, 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 there is no there is no tuition. I think they do have fees. They are operated by the Department of Transportation, not Department of Defense. But they do have an obligation. But their obligation is different. Their obligation is to sail as a merchant marine license officer for a set amount of months, for a set amount of years, and be in the Naval Reserve. But it's a it's a, a excellent school. Other questions? All right, on Zoom, do we have anything? Nothing. Thank you. Exactly an hour. All right. Thank you very much.